Welcome back to 1E9, the conference, and welcome to all viewers from the High A Festival for Science and Art in Bavaria who are also joining us now. Because what's happening now is a cooperation between High A, the Deutsches Museum, and 1E9, and we can welcome three very special guests to this very stage. And we will even hand over an exhibit that has written medical history to the, um, to the Deutsches Museum. First, let me introduce to you our guests joining us remotely are uh, Professor Esim Turecci, she's the co-founder and chief medical officer of BioNTech. She's a physician, immunologist and cancer researcher with, cancer researcher with translational and clinical experience. Great to have you he here with us. Thank you so much <laughs> for the um, introduction. Please welcome uh, Professor Ugo Schalzain, the co-founder and CEO of BioNTech. He's a physician and immunologist as well, and a leader in the development of novel approaches to fight cancer and infectious diseases. Great to have you up with us tonight. Thank you very much for that. And we are happy to have another pioneer of mRNA technology with us, and even in person in Munich, that's just uh, amazing. Welcome to Dr. Katalin Kariku, who as a biochemist specializes in RNA-mediated mechanisms and who joined BioNTech in 2030. Great to have you here. Thank you. Be, uh, before we talk to you and hear a lot of amazing stuff, uh, let's have a look at a greeting from the Bavarian State Minister for Science and the Arts, Bern Siebler, who initiated the HIA Festival. Dear Dr. Tureji, dear Professor Shahin, dear Dr. Kaviko, dear guests, vaccines based on mRNA have highlighted the importance of science for our world. Two years ago, only experts knew about the potential of this impressive technology. And now your vaccine is helping us to protect people in a fast and relatively easy way. It has been a true game changer. And this is just the beginning as the full title of today's event makes clear. This kind of vaccine may also help us in our battle against cancer. Without basic research, none of this would have been possible. We need a scientific system that gives our scientists the necessary freedom for the research, even if the outcome is unsure. The German Research Association has supported your basic work on mRNA methods. Before and beyond that, you have been persisted. Even in difficult phases, nothing could stop you. On top of your excellent scientific ability and your foresight, you have also shown courage. As soon as the first infections with COVID-19 became known, you adapted your processes at BioNTech. You made every effort to find a vaccine. And you found a very good name for your program, Project Lightspeed. You have provided great services for science and society. We cannot thank you enough. And I really hope that we can soon convince everybody to get their shot. Good science communication is key for this mission. This is why I'm such a big fan of events like the one today. In Bavaria, we also want to play our part in the development of vaccines based on mRNA. There is excellent immune research all over Bavaria. In Würzburg, we have got the Helmholtz Institute for RNA-based infection research. We have also got a new strategic alliance with sites in Regensburg, Erlangen and Würzburg. This shows that Bavaria is the perfect place for today's outstanding exhibit. The biorector in which you have created the very first batch of vaccine is truly special. And the Deutsche Museum provides the ideal setting for it, especially if we bear in mind that its name translates to German Museum of Masterpieces of Science and Technology. Thank you for this honor. I wish you all a lively panel discussion and a wonderful evening here in Munich. Yours sincerely, Bernd Siebler. Thanks, Minister Siebler. He already gave a teaser of what we are about to unveil here, but keep, please forget it so it's, an, it's a surprise in about one hour. Um, now, it's been less than a year since the COVID-19 vaccine from Bionic, BioNTech was approved in the US and a bit later in Europe too. And from the outside, it looks like a lot for you has changed. You've won many awards. You're asked to interview guests for everyone. Your company is successful, but the road to get there was not always that easy. There were setbacks and there were doubts from others. So maybe uh, what I want to like f to know first, what was your motivation and your drive to invest so much time and energy in your research? And this goes to all three of you. Maybe you want to start. 
<laughs> yeah. So science is like that, you know. It's not like you do an experiment and you get the result and immediately you proceed. So that uh, it is uh, taking time to understand the system and perform experiments. Uh, and uh, you, if you have a, a improvement and you can see the product is getting better, you get more protein in the case of RNA, then you are proceeding. So it's not like you keep doing something and just repeating and get no further. So that uh, is important and it is, it is how science uh, works. What about the, uh, uh, what about you, Mr. Tureci? What drives you to go on? <laughs> um, my motivation was that uh, uh, I and uh, this is the same for for Ugo Zahin that as uh, cancer physicians uh, we saw uh, the suffering from another pandemic from cancer and uh, we wanted to to uh, translate our science into survival for cancer patients and this was the motivation which drove us all those years to uh, invest time and efforts in developing the mRNA technology and other immunotherapeutic approaches. So motivation uh, was to um, help against suffering. You said it was for both of you, Mr. Sani. Do you want to add something anyway? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think one, one important piece in science is uh, people think that science is about knowledge. Uh, but um, a lot of science is about ima imagination and imagination is even more important than knowledge at the beginning because we, we of course, uh, we, when we started, as, as, as Kati said, yeah, uh, we, uh, we, we, things didn't work. Yeah, so, but we imagined how we could, how we might be able to use mRNA and we believed in, 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 in mRNA could work. And, and the gap between between what we imagined and what we see every day is the driver and the motivation to continue to improve so that what we imagined could be become real. Thanks for that. Now let's quickly jump right into the amazing story of how you developed the vaccine in record time. One of the key moments was in early November 2020 when you two, Aston and Ugo were waiting for a call. Do you know which call I mean? And if so, why was it such an important call? Yes, we, we know what call you mean. It was the call which was the moment of truth. Uh, namely uh, the call uh, which would uh, inform us about the outcome of our phase three clinical trial in which uh, we compared together with our partner Pfizer our vaccine uh, against the placebo. And uh, until that moment, it was, uh, uh, there was no way of knowing whether the vaccine would even work and prevent disease. And this call, which came uh, on a Sunday um, uh, evening, uh, was, was one which was like a blessing uh, because we learned that uh, our uh, phase three trial was positive and we did not only show efficacy, but showed tremendous efficacy of 95% against uh, COVID-19 disease. And what did you do when, when you heard that the vaccine actually worked? Did you celebrate wildly or what did you do? <laughs> You know, it was it was a very uh, these were very tough months for for every one of us for our team and, and and us. So we were exhausted, too exhausted to to celebrate too wildly. But uh, we uh, there was some jumping up and down and some tea drinking and uh, congratulating each other. Oh, that sounds like, like a, a crazy party. Katalin uh, Carico, uh, after decades of research in RNA and mRNA technology, how did you learn about this breakthrough, that it actually worked, and what were your thoughts then? As, as just uh, Islam saying, it was Sunday, I remember, because uh, uh, November 8 is my daughter's birthday, and uh, we celebrated with my husband, and uh, then Ugur called, and it was like afternoon, because I was in the US, so six hours. And uh, he asked me that whether is there anybody else in the room, and uh, and then he told me the, that it worked, and so I was kind of telling my husband that it worked. 
<laughs> and I, I ate the uh, chocolate covered peanut, which is my favorite. And usually even give my colleagues here in the Germany, I bring them as a, in a, a movie theater box. And I told my husband that I will eat the whole thing. And, <laughs> and anyway, so that's how I celebrated. And I was very happy. So that was a bit more than tea. <laughs> um, I pr promise everyone in the audience that we will get back to Project Lightspeed. That's how the development of the COVID-19 vaccine was called internally at BioNTech. But first, let's talk a bit science. Um, Ugo Sain, one of your most important investors, said in an interview that he was particularly impressed by your special gift of explaining complex issues in a simple and understandable way. Maybe we can get a small example of that since we are going to talk in more detail about mRNA technology. Maybe you could explain one more time in simple terms what mRNA and mRNA technology actually is. <laughs> I leave that to Esther because she can explain it even better. <laughs> Okay, I can take take over here. Um, uh, so, so uh, uh, vaccines uh, um, have a, uh, uh, have the purpose of alerting the immune system uh, against the enemy and uh, preparing thus uh, an immune response. And uh, mRNA is the most ancient information technology. So, what it delivers to the immune system of the vaccine me is uh, basically uh, the uh, print uh, the printing template for the enemy something like a wanted poster and um, uh, it not only delivers this information how the enemy looks like but it also delivers Uh, the information that an attack is needed and that this is a danger, a danger signal. And um, um, mRNA is very versatile, uh, which means it can be easily manufactured because it's a natural product. And the combination of uh, these features uh, makes it so um, uh, favorable uh, for the use as a vaccine. But as we will learn later on, also it has even more potential uh, to revolutionize me medis medicine, uh, not only for vaccines, but you were originally working on finding a cure against cancer. So what's so special about it that it has this wide uh, field of, of, of potential use cases? Maybe, yeah, yeah maybe you take this one. <laughs> I, I, I take one part and Kati takes the other part. So at the end of the day, as Özlem said, mRNA is a is a is a is a molecule which can be used to transfer information to instruct cells to make proteins. And of course, uh, uh, since this this uh, the protein could be very different one, we imagine that we could instruct the immune system to activate the immune system against cancer so that this this would be a therapeutic um, uh, cancer approach but we imagined also that we could deliver other type of immunotherapies for example antibodies attacking cancer cells and actually actually Kati when she started research had even another application in mind but 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 Kati could tell that even better Please so, do so. <laughs> so I was not interested in vaccine, not cancer vaccine or infectious disease vaccine. I want to deliver mRNA coding for protein, which actually is already in our body, but maybe not enough, not the right place, and which would accelerate healing and, and uh, curing the person. And so I want to make uh, this kind of therapeutic uh, protein coding uh, RNA and that was uh, why I you know I was uh, working on it and um, and uh, of course not realizing for a while that you know this RNA is actually not feasible for that kind of application but it was a later story <laughs> and now within the last few months this knowledge about the potential of mRNA technology has become kind of common sense, at least in most parts of society, but it wasn't always like this. So maybe you can tell us, uh, as a young researcher, um, when did you start researching RNA and mRNA? What, what, what were your thoughts? Did you think, okay, this looks interesting, I'll do um, research for a couple of years and then I'll have 
have a cure or a, how did it all start? <laughs> I mean, I started uh, working with RNA in Hungary, but those were just short RNA which had antiviral effect. It was not mRNA. In 89, in University of Pennsylvania, I started to work with mRNA and synthesize it. And, um, and the co colleagues usually were actually not very critical, actually. When I said I'm working with RNA, they kind of said that poor, poor, oh, poor Kati, you know, they <laughs> felt sorry because uh, when they had to work with RNA, it's always degraded and they thought that it is too labile and uh, so they felt sorry for me. But, uh, but I, I, uh, in my hands, it did not degrade it because the, in the laboratory, I did not uh, work with uh, an enzyme which would degrade and didn't contaminate it, the, the room. So, so I was um, working in it and, and it, uh, I could detect improvement, more protein was made and tried to figure out. Actually, I did a basic research, but I always thought about that, oh, it would be used for something. And the, but the protein made from the RNA in the cell in later in animals, it was too too small amount and then for therapeutic purposes. So try to see that how it could be improved or whether find a kind of a, a disease where a small amount is sufficient. Uh, you already said that, you know, some other researchers were saying, oh, poor Kati. Uh, in Hungary, I, I think you even lost your job as a researcher. You emigrated to the U.S., to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but even then, uh, some grant applications and papers were rejected, if I got it right. But I think it's great be because, at least that's what I get from the stories, so and I'm talking to you personally, <laughs> that you weren't demotivated because this, as the story goes, you said to your later collaborator, Drew Weissmann, when you met him by chance at the copy machine, let's clarify <laughs> if that's true, and he told you that he tries to develop a HIV vaccine that said, I can do that with mRNA. Um, I don't know if that really happened, maybe you can yeah, clarify. The, the machine was good and maybe, I, I did the outlandish statement. I just recently heard one colleague who was, uh, studying uh, surgery and I told it by that time it will be obsolete because RNA will be replaced everything so maybe <laughs> I did the outlandish statement but really I just offered uh, to Drew that I can I can make RNA and that's what I I was bragging about that I can make RNA and so this how it started yeah, and now um, <laughs> you get all, all the prizes as well as you, as the Trajan Uwe Sain. You've also been researching mRNA technology for, for more than two decades, and initially you focused on developing individualized, individualized treatments for cancer patients. Why did you focus on, on cancer treatment in particular, and why did you choose mRNA back then? Because back then it wasn't like the mainstream thing to do. So, um, uh, cancer, why we focused on cancer, the, the answer is very easy because we were cancer physicians and we could, um, uh, we, we would uh, experience every day uh, that uh, what we could offer our patients, which was at that time in the early 1990s, chemotherapy, radiotherapy or surgery, that uh, this was not much uh, what was in the armamentarium uh, of um, oncology in those times. And on the other hand, at the same time we were working in the lab and were researchers, we experienced that there is so much um, uh, science and in particular immunology could offer. So uh, one thing which we um, uh, believed in was that if we want to uh, develop an ideal um, cancer treatment, we need to harness the immune system because in principle the immune system can be very potent, it has the adaptability of a predator, and at the same time, uh, it can uh, act um, uh, very precisely. And in order to instruct the immune system to do all this and fight against, against cancer, uh, you, you need a cancer vaccine. So um, it was very clear we would need to develop vaccines. And a vaccine needs to be very potent because at the time cancer is uh, diagnosed, uh, it has already invaded the body. There are billions of cells and there are heterogeneous. And that, that again means uh, that we need something which is individualized because every patient's 
tumor is unique and um, the ideal situation would be to have a cancer vaccine which is tailored uh, and on demand produced according to that individual patient's tumor and uh, genetic makeup. And um, uh, we um, tried different platforms and understood uh, very quickly that mRNA would have the potential to address all those uh, needs for a cancer treatment. That was the beginning. And uh, however, it took a long journey because uh, we needed to optimize MR mRNA on different levels in order to actualize the full potential as a cancer treatment. It's a pretty complicated stuff for people who don't work in science. For people who are not working inside, it, it always seems incredibly long, how long medical research t takes, especially if you take, compare it to the world of digital technology, you know, where companies like Google or Facebook just pop up. So um, maybe uh, you could still take us with, with on this journey a bit that you just mentioned. What was uh, the problem or the challenge with mRNA that could not be solved or maybe not perfectly solved for so long? And how did the three of you um, finally uh, solve it? Maybe uh, Ugo, Ugo San, you want to start? Yeah. yeah, so there is not only one problem. Uh, 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 it is at the end of the day, if you want to accomplish something, something like like making mRNA work, uh, it is you can compare compare that with the idea for building a first time uh, a plane or building a rocket, and and you need to solve a number of technical challenges. So one challenge is. Uh, to stimulate the immune system and, and understand what is really relevant to get strong immune responses. So what we learned from immunology is that a vaccine needs to be delivered to specialized cells, uh, so-called dendritic cells, uh, a delivery. So the delivery of the mRNA to the right cells is a problem. The second uh, thing is that the immune system needs to be activated to not only to get the information, but be able to strongly mount an immune response. So we had to solve that. And the third aspect is, is that the message, uh, the information must be appropriate so that, that even delivering low doses could help to get strong immune responses. So it was the potency. Yeah. So that were challenges on our side yeah, that needed to be solved. And, um, and, uh, and as Kati said, uh, you, uh, we start to do experiments. We have hypotheses, we evaluate. And in 80, 90 percent of these cases, we find out that the hypotheses are wrong. Yeah. And sometimes we, by chance, make findings. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, for example, we made we made by chance the finding that something we wrongly cloned, yeah, yeah, uh, turned out to work uh, uh, particularly well, yeah, by the discovery that that instead of one element that we wanted to clone, two elements were in the mRNA. So we came up with the idea: oh, can we combine elements? So these are the way how to deal with that, having a challenge, having different challenges, and trying to solve the challenge by by modifying different aspects of mRNA. And and I stop here and Kati Kati could could take take and the complementary part. Yes. So um one, one problem was, of course, we mentioned that it is very labile. Labile in when you inject in the body. And uh, the other is even when it's cell you inject, uh, you know, it was uh, degrading uh, quickly. And so the encoded protein, we can see short period of time. So um, when with Ugur, we went actually visited a one big uh, pharma company and they showed that every day it was 10 times less protein was made. And they told us that if you can change that and every day it will be the same, come back. You remember Ugur that? <laughs> and <laughs> so. That was one thing. And the other is for investors who wanted to invest money. Then they uh, criticized that uh, there is no shelf life. So they wanted, uh, they said that if you can put something there and for two years, you can take out aliquots. 
and then you can make trial and other things. So that was also not solved. We, you know, how you formulate and keep it there. And uh, another thing that most of the other scientists were trying to use the mRNA for for a problem, which the gene therapy problem, and they wanted to more uh, longer. Uh, period of time to get the translation. You, you know, today we know that how good that, uh, you know, the spike protein is just made for a short period of time. Nobody wants to do rest of their life. So it is good that it degrades. It's good that it is just a short period of time. But at that time, uh, at the early on, people try to use for gene therapy purposes. And that's also why people thought that, oh, it's just too short of the effect. So many level was uh, the problem. It seems like it was a complex thing. <laughs> uh, we are glad that you, you achieved it to, to solve it. Now, as you said, you were talking to investors, you were visiting other companies, because maybe the solution or, or the solutions that you found would have not be, would be of less use to us in the current pandemic if you had you know, just published, as you did, scientific papers uh, and not built a company like BioNTech. Um, when you uh, two co-founded the company, and uh, you two co-founded the company in 28, um, you joined it in 2013, and this step from academia into a company, especially in Germany and Europe, that is too rarely ventured. That's what many critics say. Um, why did you decide to do it anyway? You know what? Yeah, what was the reason to say, okay, we step out of uh, academia, uh, we still do research, but we do it within a company. Yes, um, it was in, prin in principle the strong determination to translate our science. We, as, as, as I already pointed out, we are physicians and scientists and uh, uh, the, the motivation is to bring indeed the science from the lab benches to the patient's bedside and uh, help against suffering. And um, we became founders and entrepreneurs out of desperation because we uh, learned that there was no other way to, uh, to uh, ensure exactly this translation. And what so, was the so yeah the, sorry mm -hmm. yeah Please. so the limiting fact the limiting factor is if you really want to develop drugs to be tested in 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 patients uh, you you need a huge amount of investment so to prepare a novel approach uh, for for clinical testing we had to set up the manufacturing of mRNA of course in the lab you can you can relatively quickly do for for uh, experiments with laboratory quality based of mRNA but if you want to have the same mRNA for clinical application you pay you have to to invest um, tens of millions of of, uh, of euro yeah just to build a manufacturing to ensure that the mRNA has the right quality yeah before you are able to do a clinical trial so it was very clear that this this financing of this project would not be possible in the academic setting what is also important to understand is that at a certain uh, certain limit yeah uh, uh, if you, if you, for example, uh, have a solution, an mRNA, uh, which which qualifies uh, for for certain application, then 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 it is okay from the academic setting to have 80% of the problem solved, but the last 20% solving solving the last 20% really means additional 10 times investment. Uh, because the quality considerations and the requirements for developing drugs are so extremely high. Yeah? So that was the reason that we, that we decided to go into a company, to start a company, and we were happy and lucky that we got the funding yeah, uh, from investors yeah, who were not classical investors, but investors who really also wanted to help us uh, to develop uh, new treatments, uh, innovative treatments, and uh, and uh, that allowed us in the first first six years to build the technology, to build GMP manufacturing, and to enable to start our first clinical trials in 2012. I just 
to mention. So I myself also in 2006 with my colleague, we established the company because we wanted to uh, develop further, but it was just the start and we couldn't uh, get funding. And uh, the main reason actually I came to uh, BioNTech because, uh, and people question that, you know, the wrong direction, usually people go to the U.S. If they <laughs> and I came here because uh, I learned that uh, at BioNTech already has clinical trial, the mRNA, and uh, because I wanted to develop the messenger RNA, which contains this nucleoside modification to clinic, I thought that uh, it would be the best place to come, and uh, because already uh, there is manufacturing, there is already clinical trial, and uh, I was just so impressed with the kind of thing uh, that I learned that um, here in the company, it, we have to make a product that is important and everybody works together. And, and I also realized that how much work is to make a company. And I watched Ugur that, and Uslam that how they, they did. And there's a lot of, lot of work. So, um, as you said, that's a very unusual story that, uh, you know, researchers go from the U.S. to Germany to join a company. No, now, maybe uh, you already mentioned some uh, of these, but maybe you can talk about the factors that contributed to your success, because I guess we would all be happy if we see more companies like BioNTech. So, um, what, what were like the success factors that you say, okay, that, that's um, the foundation of where we are now? I start, then, then, then. <laughs> so I think one success factor is really focusing on the problem. So, so BioNTech is is uh, is for sure not the usual biotech, which comes with a uh, with with the idea of of um, um, of bringing a product as quickly as possible into clinical testing and hoping it will work. So we really invested many, many years before we started our first clinical trial. And we, we, were, we were always scientifically, from the very beginning, scientifically, scientific, scientifically driven. That was also the reason why, why for example, for example uh, we were interested that Katie joins us, joins us. So we had some industry expert, but we really recruited scientists yeah, from academic institutions, from Max Planck institutions, from universities. Katie ca came to us and we realized that we have like-minded people in, in, in our company who, who in a scientifically driven and fully dedicated, committed manner, yeah, tried to solve the basic challenges to enable that we get a highly active Money. So that is one success factor, really focusing on science. Any, any other factors that we might learn from? <laughs> yes, uh, well, these, were, uh, these were two factors, uh, science and the focus on science and being led by science. And the other one you named, uh, which I would like to, to, to uh, also echo, is, is people. Uh, and this starts from from our investors. We chose the right investors who who um, uh, were committed to the mission of the company. Uh, we had the the, the right team um, uh, with people who were scientifically uh, focused, and uh, uh, we we also chose the right business model, uh, namely not in a fast focused lean way, just uh, focusing on one product and. Uh, and developing as, it as fast as possible, uh, but uh, um, uh, uh, having a, um, a, a, a technology platform or several uh, several technology platforms in which we iteratively invested for for improvement. Uh, thanks for, for for this advice. Now, as I promised, we'll come back to Project Lightspeed now. I know if you've had to tell this story many times before, but it's historic and it's just a great story. So I'm sure many here would like to hear it too, um, at least the beginning. Um, Ugesan, in January 2020, most of us still, me included, thought COVID-19 had nothing to do with us in Germany and Europe. The outbreak will certainly be contained in, in China soon. And yet you already came up with the idea that your company, BioNTech, which was actually focusing on things like cancer treatments uh, could and should now produce a vaccine. 
why <laughs> Yeah, so 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 I was also not concerned at the mid mid January about about this outbreak in China, but uh, in in end of January I read a Lancet paper which came out the same day. Yeah, and in the Lancet paper uh, this outbreak was described in a extremely clear fashion, and the outbreak had all the criteria. Uh, uh, for for becoming becoming a, a, a global pandemic, uh, and uh, a new virus, uh, highly infective, in a Chinese mega city with high travels, uh, and one of the key aspects that were were evident from this paper that th this virus uh, induces asymptomatic infections, which make it impossible to to control and, uh, const, uh, and and keep the pandemic in the in the localization and we already knew uh, on the same day that we will encounter a global global pandemic in the coming weeks and the question was can we develop a vaccine and since we we had a powerful vaccine technology allowing us to induce uh, strong um, immune responses and since we ha had built the ability to really quickly come up with a vaccine because of this personalized immunotherapy approach so we had implemented in the company the ability to develop cancer vaccines within a few weeks yeah, and we said if we can develop cancer vaccine in, in a few weeks, it should be also possible to make mRNA vaccines uh, against this new virus in a few weeks. And so, so that was the belief that we can do something against this pandemic, and uh, and 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 it was an obligation to start a project because we knew that we could be among the first companies and groups worldwide coming up with a potentially effective vaccine. Now, we all know now that it worked out, but uh, Aslam Turchi, what was your first reaction when your husband told you that he was going or he was proposing to even risk the future of your company uh, to develop a vaccine against a disease that many thought was not our problem here? Um, well, he had science on his side. So uh, when when uh, he shared his uh, concerns, uh, he basically shared a math mathematical model, uh, which uh, was very convincing and which basically said that uh, we are already in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, it was even scarier because he offered uh, two um, scenarios, one scenario of a slow ramp up of the pandemic, which actually was the scenario which then at the end became real. So the one through which uh, all of us uh, had uh, to, uh, to go. And the other scenario was a very fast evolving pandemic, which would uh, not give uh, mankind any time to prevent that we all would be decimated. So um, there, therefore, there was not much uh, work he needed to do to convince me uh, and also convince others, our team at the company. Um, how about you, uh, Katrin Kariko? When did you hear about this plan and what were your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I heard about the uh, what happening in China, and uh, I, I was, um, you know, not thinking also that it will be, it will be here, and, uh, you know, we had this vision that, um, that, you know, and uh, foreseen that maybe it will happen here and coming, and it will be a pandemic. So, I, I, I was not such a visioner to predict that, and so I was uh, uh, not concerned. But luckily, he was and uh, Islam, and so that's why it happened that started the project. Now, the, now the rest is a, a kind of history. Uh, you and your team developed the vaccine in, in record time. You ensured that it could be produced and administered in billions of, of uh, doses. And for those who want to know more about this history, I highly recommend the book you, you um, two wrote with Joe Miller. It's called Project Lightspeed, but. Uh, I want to talk with you about the, the future as, as well, because um, now um, we all know about mRNA technology, so let's talk about what's possible with it and what, what you are planning. But maybe, uh, Katrin Kariko, um, um, you, you answer a question first, because in interview, 
interviews that I, I read, you, you've said that at the beginning of your career, you had the idea that at some point we will have mRNA in our refrigerator to treat, for example, blisters on our feet. Um, how do you envision our future with mRNA now? Yeah, actually, my daughter is a rower and she had all the blisters in her hands. And I was thinking about that, what kind of mRNA could accelerate healing. And I found that collagen 7 protein can accelerate. And it is also interesting because, you know, we are talking about here, the, not the mRNA is really the final product which will heal, but the protein is coded. And the protein, that protein actually half-life is very long. So the, even the RNA is gone, the protein can be there for months. So I was thinking about this uh, accelerate the healing and other things were also like uh, work with colleagues that uh, uh, working on uh, pain killing, but it was a natural way. And so I thought that uh, most, most of us would need, uh, you know, some treatment acute disease, which aches and pains. And um, therefore I was not thinking about um, problem immunogenicity because I thought that we just have to have the same protein, which already we have in our body. And so it turned out, of course, that the RNA we are making the basic nucleotides, those are inflammatory, so I spent so much time to make it uh, with non-inflammatory with my colleague at Penn, and, and then so uh, this kind of RNA, I was thinking uh, this kind of uh, uh, simple diseases, which is really, I learned from Ugur actually that um, it is very difficult to run a clinical trial for things that heal on their own because it is difficult to measure something. And I, I learned so much that I get good ideas and then I realize that it is not that good because it is um, uh, difficult to run a trial, difficult uh, to implement and measure something that uh, it is effective. So, but there are a lot of things that uh, whenever I listen to a lecture, somebody talks about a disease, I think that, oh, it will be good to treat with RNA. So some examples? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just said, you know, pain. Actually, our first grant we submitted was for uh, treatment for anemia. So that, again, a protein, the erythropoietin coding uh, mRNA, it was an animal model, and we demonstrated that uh, the hematocrit increase, more red blood cells was produced. And uh, so it, it is, again, just uh, transiently applying the mRNA coding for the protein, and then you have biological effect, and then you just stop. It is more like a conventional uh, uh, medicine. You treat, you use for once or twice, and then fix the problem. Um. SM Turchi Ugasan, when you uh, co founded BioNTech, as we said, to uh, develop individualized uh, cancer therapies, um, now BioNTech is highly successful with vaccines, uh, as we all heard. Um, you could say, okay, let's just uh, make this kind of vaccine forever, um, but uh, I guess that's not the case. So, will you still continue to uh, pursue this goal uh, the, of the cancer treatments that you, you started with, despite the success of this COVID 19 vaccine? Definitely, uh, we will do that. That was uh, and still is our original vision. We were a bit distracted now with uh, the pandemic and had to have had to help to solve it in order to now uh, go back to our original mission, uh, which we never uh, sort of paused. So cancer vaccines and other types of cancer immunotherapies based on mRNA will continue to be uh, very close to our hearts and uh, we will develop them. And beyond that, there are other areas in which uh, we believe that um, our mRNA technology now in its um, uh, further refined uh, form uh, with the experience of a Lightspeed project uh, can uh, help. Uh, these are, for example, other infectious diseases malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV, um, all pathogens which are with uh, mankind for uh, much longer than the coronavirus, um, all uh, pathogens uh, who have developed uh, mechanisms to escape our immune system actively. Um, uh, these are also areas in which we want to uh, use mRNA. And uh, there's also um, many indications beyond that. One uh, indication 
situation we are particularly interested in are autoimmune diseases, um, uh, such as, for, for example, multiple sclerosis, because um, uh, as we already pointed out, you can use mRNA to tell the immune system what to attack, but you can also use it to tell the immune system what not to attack, namely those um, uh, self uh, proteins which are attacked in the case of autoimmune diseases. Now we all learned that it could be can be quick, quick, uh, pretty fast to develop a, a new vaccine, a new treatment. Now maybe you could give us a timeline on on the projects that you will say when we will we see results. When do you expect um, treatments and, and new vaccines here? So our cancer vaccines uh, are already in uh, phase two of three phases of clinical development through which uh, a drug which is developed has uh, to go. And uh, these phase two trials are very important because in those uh, one has to compare against the standard treatment for that respective disease or, or cancer indication. And as soon as we have data from those trials, uh, we will know how long it takes to get uh, to an approval. That could be within the next couple of years, the next three to four to five years. Um. Uwe, um, Sahin, um, no, it goes to all of you. Now, you get all this recognition now for your work. You won those prizes. Um, everyone, um, you know, many people are very thankful for, for what you did, you know, that you kind of um, saved many of us from a horrible pandemic. Um, from this recognition as a scientist, and, and, and I think it's great you still state scientists and researchers, <laughs> what, what was most important to you? Personally, Pers you start? yeah. Pers personally, to be honest, is we 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 feel blessed that we, that as a scientist we could make a difference. Yeah, so because because uh, all of us started with the idea to develop something which could help people. Yeah, and uh, the the greatest prize we achieved is that we were able to make a difference. Yeah. And everything else is, is 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 wonderful, but nothing matches matches this feeling that you know that 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 you you contribute to something. And of course, it is not only the three of us. It was a huge scientific community. Um, uh, if you if you really ask for for each of the details, you most likely end up with with several thousand scientists. And that have directly or indirectly contributed uh, to the success yeah? and this progress of the mRNA field and of the making of the mRNA, of the manufacturing of the mRNA. Uh, but we feel really blessed and that that during during the during our life we were able to make a difference, and that's the greatest award that that a scientist can get. Maybe you remember. Um, uh an incident where someone approached you or where someone thanked you? Was there moments like this when you really could feel it personally um, that, you know, you made this impact? Any of you? Yes, yes, we, we got, for example, a picture of a of a grandfather with, with his, uh, with his, uh, with his um, um, uh, son? Uh, uh, with son and, and the kids, yeah. And they were they 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 wrote us they were that they were what more than uh, almost one year apart uh, and could not join and they were able after the vaccination to rejoin and it was a some somehow a great family picture uh, showing show showing showing the uh, reunion of this of this family and 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 when seeing this picture I I realized that there are many many personal stories. Of, of people who who got vaccinated, yeah, and who have this life-changing event, yeah, to be able to go back uh, again to a almost normal life. Yeah, actually, I also get an email from a 
the Meadowbrook, uh, New York uh, State uh, elderly home. And then they reported me that uh, one week after I received the vaccine, which was televised, uh, one week later, all of the residents received, and there were 200 residents there. And uh, but one week later, they already found that some people get uh, infected. And uh, in before that, it was when in an elderly home somebody get infected and others get. Uh, at the end, you know, a lot of people died, and they reported me that nobody died, and so were they so happy, and they made a. Catalin Carico Appreciation Day in <laughs> September, and everybody had a T-shirt with my picture, and they sent me <laughs> that photo. And uh, of course, you know, similarly to Ugur, you know, uh, and uh, Islam, that we know that so many people contributed, but some people just happy to point out somebody and say that, oh, I thank to them. But um, we know all of us that a uh, lot of people. And uh, myself, I feel just, um, uh, you know, happy to know that I am one of them. And, and when I did the research uh, also, I never was important that it is my name or me. It was, uh, I was happy that uh, I was part of the project. And many times we mentioned that, you know, the patient never asked who developed the drug. They just asked the doctor, do, do, they, do you have something for my disease? And... But uh, now that we are here and now people start to know that, oh, there are scientists and it is also a good, pro good, good thing that we are here today, for example, that uh, people realize, yeah, these scientists, uh, our lives depend on and maybe, you know, they, will rem they can name at least one or two scientists who are still alive today. Because <laughs> when you ask a person, name a scientist, you know, maybe say Einstein and they, that's it. Yeah, we could walk over to the museum and see a lot of famous but dead uh, scientists. Um, uh, also, living ones. also living ones, absolutely. Um, um, and, uh, Katrin, you shared your personal stories and it's just so great to hear his personal stories. So maybe Aslan Turic, you, you have one for us too. <laughs> Oh, oh, there are so many. I, I would really not know which one 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 to pick. We get so many emails. Uh, we get uh, we got, for example, a video clip of of uh, uh, hospital staff uh, who um, uh, uh, danced for us, uh, uh, and one could really feel how relieved they were because after vaccination. Uh, it was easier for them to take care of, uh, of their patients. We uh, get um, pictures drawn by, by kids uh, who, who thank us. And uh, uh, the example Ugo just uh, um, uh, uh, noted uh, with grandparents uh, seeing their, their grandchildren uh, even newborn grandchildren where only after months they could uh, meet uh, this, uh, this new member of the family. So there are so many stories. That's great uh, to hear all of them, even especially in times like this when it's not yet over, but uh, we, we still stay optimistic. Now, as I promised, um, uh, and as the minister already teased, we will hand over um, a historic um, object to the Deutsches Museum and we will get it on stage now and we will also get someone you already heard a second ago, <laughs> um, Professor Wolfgang Heckel, uh, please come on stage, uh, join us on stage, the general director general of the Deutsches Museum. Um, we stand up uh, and now those who will unveil the object that it's about to on that is about to become a part of the exhibition of the Deutsches Museum. And there <laughs> here we go. Oh. It is. Yeah, <laughs> you may clap your hands. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katali uh, Kariko, Eslim, Ugo. <laughs> Um, we are really proud to receive this masterpiece of science and technology. The story of the Deutsches Museum is, the duty of the Deutsches Museum is to tell the story of mankind alongside with these kind of masterpieces of science and technology. And this is a true masterpiece of science and technology because it has proven, and I remember when uh, Eslem and Ugo were a couple of weeks ago in my office, and we discussed about my research, the, uh, the origin of life. 
that you are true scientists and you made a difference with such scientific achievement in such a light speed time and you are now part of uh, 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 Benz Motor Wagon, you're part of Rentgen's first um, uh, X-ray apparatus, you're part of the first uh, 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 quantum uh, chip, uh, the Sycamo chip from Google and this uh, is all based I guess uh, and the story is really that we can tell our 1.5 million visitors a year that science technology makes a difference and it can save lives. I was so impressed when you, uh, Islam, you told me that you have at that time, a couple of weeks ago, I think I remember, produced 43 kilograms of mRNA <laughs> and it saved a billion people's life. Wow, <laughs> what can be greater than that? Yeah? You really deserve to be part of the story of the masterpieces <laughs> and the masters of the s technology and science in the Deutsches Museum. Thank you so much, <laughs> Kathleen Ugur Eslem. And thank you thank for my to all four of you, but if I may quickly jump in now, we see that it's a masterpiece of science and technology, but maybe we can learn what it actually is, because it looks, <laughs> it looks kind of weird. It's a kind of art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Science and art and technology have so, something in common. So maybe you could... Please, Katalin. Yeah. So this is a bioreactor. This is how the RNA was made inside this, in this uh, uh, container. And uh, all of these tubings is how the components are added to it. Ugur, you want to say something about this yeah. special bioreactor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is the this is the first step of manufacturing of mRNA, uh, bringing an enzyme and DNA template and all the components which are required, and it takes a few hours uh, to and that the DNA is copied into mRNA. Uh, and every DNA uh, is copied into multiple mRNAs. And, uh, and our team was, in the last, last um, 10 years, our teams worked so hard uh, to, to, we started, when we started to do our research, it was just 250 microgram of mRNA that we could get from such a reaction. And now, in the meantime, we are able to get from one reaction more than 250 gram or even more, which is a scale up of one, one million uh, uh, in, the, in the production. And, and, and that was also needed at the end of the day uh, to ensure that so many people could get their vaccines. And maybe we have to point it out because this is actually the bioreactor that the first uh, doses of the vaccine that we all got were made, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and and I had a bit of an impression, Wolfgang, uh, that uh, that you were uh, uh, you were disappointed that uh, we announced uh, the bioreactor and uh, it has this it had this underwhelming size, right? You expect to <laughs> get something on a truck transported into the museum, but this actually shows how potent the mRNA is. This is also why we only need 30 micrograms per dose of the vaccine. And this is also the reason why we were able uh, to deliver so many doses in such a short time, this underwhelming size. Islam, you are absolutely right. I, five hours ago, I got a shot BioNTech here in my arm uh, and it, I, I didn't feel it. Uh, it was so small quantity. But uh, museum pedagogics uh, is about to explain why this item, this object, uh, leads us to new uh, horizons. And uh, it is important to know that uh, you just copied nature. Catalin, you copied nature because in nature, uh, small amounts of R uh, uh, messenger RNA uh, and not DNA because DNA has to be safe. Yeah, it's copied into messenger RNA and then it goes to the ribosome and then the ribosome catches the transfer RNA and produces the protein and the spike protein. This is the story we have to tell here to our people, especially also to the young people who would want to follow you in your life career because we need more of you 
uh, people, scientists who become entrepreneurs, who become people who help other people. A billion people, maybe now two billion people, have uh, uh, got your vaccine. And this is fantastic. I can't say better, uh, t uh, better examples as masterpieces of science and technology for the Deutsches Museum. I'm so thankful for us, for the Deutsches Museum, for all the people who will visit and know and get known to the story of you uh, people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Katalin Kariko, SM Tureci, Uwe Schein, Professor Wolfgang Heckel. I was never more excited before an interview. I, I hope it went well. <laughs> Sorry if it didn't. I was very excited because these, it was... These are lovely guys. Yes, yeah. I know, these I know. These are scientists and therefore they are good guys. Sci yeah. Scientists who, who made history and who really made a difference. It was an honor for me to do this. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having us. And you guys out there, make sure to visit the Deutsches Museum in you know, a sh pretty short time to see this object. Can you already tell us when, when we will see Next this? Next year, beginning of May. Beginning of May, so come here in the meantime and then come back in May to visit Deutsch Museum. Thank you so much for the session. This was amazing. Uh, good luck for your future work and thank you so much. Um, yeah, this, this was the big mRNA, mRNA session with a historic um, uh, object that we delivered to the Deutsch Museum. Thank you for that.